This is Teachers Talk Radio, and you are listening live. Good afternoon. This is Teachers Talk Radio, and you're listening to the Sunday afternoon show with Maud. It is 5 p.m. on Sunday, the 10th of July, and you can join me using the chat function. We can discuss today's topic, which is EAL coordinator, its role and how to promote diversity in teaching. Welcome! This is Teachers Talk Radio and you are listening live. Tune in live at ttradio.org or to join in the conversation, download the Podbean app and search Teachers Talk Radio. Follow the hashtag TT Radio. Tune in, talk it out with Teachers Talk Radio. Good afternoon, fellow educators and dear listeners. This is my 13th radio show as a hostess, and I'm very much delighted to share this experience in your company. But first, I have to introduce myself. I'm a French citizen of French and West African ancestry. I have lived in the UK since 2008, and I'm a professional educator. I work in a secondary state school in North London, where I teach languages as well as humanities. I have also experience as a teacher in the charity sector. You can follow me on Twitter at profprofmfl. All views are my own. Today, I would like to focus on one topic that is relevant to me as an educator and also personally in my daily working life. The podcast and discussion will be both on the topic of EAL coordinator and their role in promoting diversity in teaching. This is mostly relevant to anyone who works in education, mostly teachers and educators, but also SLC. Parents who have children who are EAL students and also anyone who is curious anyone who is interested in fairness, diversity, in education for the next generation. So please uh, interact with us on the chat or use Twitter at ProfProfMFL if you have anything to say about EAL education. So now I need to first enlighten our parents who might not know what EAL stands for. So EAL is an acronym that says English as an additional language. So any EAL student or student with EAL is a student who happens to be born in a family where English is not the uh, first language. So it might be someone who speaks maybe Spanish at home with their parents or someone who speaks Mandarin or Urdu or Hebrew or Farsi, anyone whose mother tongue is not English, and yet someone who's going to have to navigate the educational setting in English. As you know me by now, I'm very much interested in diversity and uh, promoting fairness in treatment and in education. I also work a lot on decolonizing the curriculum. So today I wanted to focus on EAL learning, so English as an additional learning, with that perspective of making EAL learning decolonized, which means a lot of things, but it definitely means that we need to promote everybody's culture and everybody's language, not just English. First, we need to talk about community languages. Um, what does community language mean? Well, it's quite simple. It's all the languages that are spoken in a country which are not official languages recognized in administration or institutions and languages that are spoken by the people who live in the community. So there's many, many community languages in the UK. Some have been community languages for hundreds of years, if not thousands. I'm thinking of my mother tongue, French, for instance. There's been French speakers in the UK since, I would say, the time of William the Conqueror, uh, which is 1066. 
So there has been community languages which have been present for a millennium, but there's also community languages who have arrived more recently. Um, community languages are brought by migrants, immigrant communities, when they settle in the UK, they bring their culture, they bring their food, and we're thankful for that. And they also bring their language. So in the recent decades, and since England really opened itself for immigrants, a lot more community languages have been brought. So you can look at a map of community languages and you will see that there's different colors according to the type of um, migration we experience. For instance, up north in some cities, I'm thinking of Bradford, for instance, you're going to have a lot of South Asian communities residing and they usually have lots of uh, distinct languages. British Asians of Punjabi origin, for example, are approximately 2 million in the UK. This is the largest population from South Asia, the Punjabi population. And they usually um, either come from Pakistan or India, and they use Punjabi as their mother tongue. So it makes Punjabi the third community language in the UK. The UK has also approximately 700,000 Bengali speakers, and about 550,000 of this Bengali-speaking community use a language called Silheti, which is regarded as a distinct language or Bengali dialect. So you do have a lot of different languages, even though this is quite a big proportion of the South Asian community. Now, there's a very recent community language uh, which has um, developed in the UK, and that's Polish. It has grown a lot and extensively since the immigrant population coming from Poland settled in England and Wales. In 2001, so which is just 21 years ago, Polish did not feature in the top 12 languages spoken in the UK. And since 2004, Poland joined the EU and this boosted the immigration of Poles to the British territory. So much that in 2007, a record of 96,000 Poles moved to the UK. So when they moved, they brought their language. Now, Polish people, mostly settled in London or the South East, have brought their language. And it is one of the most spoken community language in 2022. In the 2011 census, we identified 269,000 Urdu speakers. So they can speak Urdu if they're from Pakistan, but also Afghanistan. So it might be a growing population in the UK now. Other immigrant languages or community languages are Gujarati, Mandarin, Tamil, Arabic, Somali, but also EU speaking communities such as Romanian language, Italian, and also Turkish. As I was saying, French and also German have been um, community languages in the UK for, for centuries. Um, and uh, it is interesting to think that also the renewal of the language has been brought up since the 17th century when the Huguenots settled in Soho and Spitalfields. Now we can also refer to Mandarin and Cantonese, which have been spoken mostly in Soho in Chinatown, for instance. So community languages are derived from immigration and they are brought by the population who settle in the UK. Now, what does it do about education? There are almost 1.6 million pupils in the UK who are children with EAL, which means that English is not their first language. And all these children are mostly in maintained schools in England and Wales. This number has more than doubled since 2006. So if you imagine in one generation, which is approximately 20 to 25 years, we have more than doubled the number of children who have English as an additional language. So for me, it's a wealth 
to speak more than one language. But there is also some difficulties associating to settling in a country or being born in a family where the, the official language is maybe not spoken as much. Most of the students who have English as an additional language live in London, which is making sense because this is the capital and this is the first port of call when someone settles in a new country. We usually arrive near the airport and most airports are around London. But as I was saying, there's also communities up north, maybe in Bradford, for instance, and some in uh, seaside towns and also in Wales. Now, you know that I've been working on decolonizing the curriculum. So today I want to br bring that perspective in EAL teaching. But first I need to define what decolonizing the curriculum mean. Decolonizing the curriculum asks us, as citizens of the world, to look at our shared assumptions about how the world around us is. Decolonizing the curriculum forces us to question the impact of history and the impact in particular of colonization on our economy, but also on our cultural representations. So this is the first aspect of decolonizing the curriculum. Now, the second aspect of decolonizing the curriculum is asking us to think about the implications of a more diverse student body in terms of how we teach these students and how they achieve in life and society. So if I want to decolonize my practice as a teacher, I need to question where in the world I live in and how my society has been affected by colonization and slavery as well. And in my teaching, I need to think, how can I make my students who are a, a diverse bunch, how can I make them feel represented? Uh, how can I make them succeed? And how can I make my lessons diverse and decolonized? And the third aspect of decolonizing the curriculum means that I need to promote public and historical figures who are not Europeans and maybe not white as well, which means people who are defined in the UK as BAME, black and uh, Asian ethnic minorities. So this is what I'm looking at today. The perspective of decolonizing the curriculum makes me question the society I live in. Is it a fair society? Is it a diverse society? Is it a society that promotes all children, whether they're com where they're coming from? Is it a society that offers them a good quality education? and that promotes their achievement, nurtures their achievement? And is it a society where people of ethnic minorities have their place and are welcome? So this is quite a task, isn't it? Now, obviously, today we are talking about decolonizing EAL teaching, which is decolonizing teaching English to people who don't have English as their first language. Now, your first remark might be, well, if we need to teach English to our students, we can't really bring anything about decolonizing because it's obviously uh, a language that is the language that was used by people who did colonize. So if we teach English, we, we can't really decolonize that way. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna disagree. And I'm gonna say there is a way to decolonize EAL teaching. And this is what I'm gonna develop today in your lovely company. So what does decolonizing EAL teaching means then? Well, for me, it means understanding why people migrate in this world and being respectful of what they bring as migrants, understanding them, respecting them and welcoming them. Decolonizing the EAL curriculum means understanding that there is powers at play and there is a hierarchy in language learning in our current globalized world. Decolonizing EAL learning and teaching means that I need to be aware of that hierarchy and I need to try and maybe shift some of it to make it more equal. 
The second aspect of decolonizing the EAL curriculum means celebrating other cultures and praising children who have English as an additional language. And this is what I think has been mostly done so far, but maybe not to the extent that has a virtual concrete impact on our local communities. And a third aspect about decolonizing the EAL curriculum means encouraging the contribution of immigrants and refugees and their descendants in the shaping of our society. So if I go back to the example of the Huguenots who came from France because and were, they were fleeing persecution um, started by Louis XIV. If, and, and this is a great example of actually a decolonized um, um, Yale te teaching because the Huguenots were welcome in the UK. They were given a chance to settle and what they brought was welcome. Their food tradition, their uh, particularly their art craft. There were people who brought silverware and silk weaving and the, the fabric of, of clothing, whole industries. And this was welcomed in English society. So to my, in, in my view, the Huguenots were definitely a success story of what um, assimilation and welcoming immigrants is. So this is what I would like us to think about. Are we offering that same warm, welcome, uh, empathetic and sympathetic welcome to all the migrants who come to the UK and all our students who do not have English as their mother tongue? So first, if we want to um, welcome our EAL students in our schools, we need to know who they are. And you would be surprised, but when we get a new student, it can be in the middle of the week, in the middle of term, and they're just literally dropped in our classroom. We barely have their names on the register sometimes because the Sims hasn't been uploaded. So it can be really hard to have the time and the um, means to welcome new students who come in the middle of the year. So this is why having an EAL coordinator is so important in a school. Obviously, if you do happen to work in the Hebrides in Scotland or in a town with, which has very, very low migration levels, you're not going to have an EAL coordinator. EAL stands for English as an Additional Language Coordinator. Saying that, I do think every school should just have a look at the local area they serve, and serve is, is an important word there. As a school, we need to serve our local community. So we need to make a list of the population around the school, and we need to know if there's EAL population, population who has English as an additional language. And if we do, I would say every school has a duty to have a designated EAL coordinator, someone who is going to be the person who welcomes people who do not speak English as a first language, giving them the opportunities and the means to get into the classroom and be welcome and feel safe in their new environment. So definitely the EAL coordinator is to me a very important person in the school. Now, the ELL coordinator is going to have to devise a series of uh, options and maybe different timetable for that student who just arrives in a school. In my experience, I've had students who came from Afghanistan, for instance, and they had been crossing so many countries. And on their way from Afghanistan, they had learned German, they had learned a bit of Turkish, they had learned a bit of French, and then they were they just arrived in the UK, not speaking a word of English, having all this background of different languages. And they were literally dropped from one day to the next in my Spanish or French lesson. So imagine the confusion and the, the mental overload of having been through so many different places. I'm not even mentioning the difficulties of their uh, trip through different continents. I'm just thinking of the amount of languages they've been exposed to. So I would definitely advise the EAL coordinator to take this into account. The mental load that these students who have been exposed to so many languages must feel. 
As a linguist myself, I know how exhausting it can be to be switching from different languages for a brief period of time. So I do think we definitely need to have a special timetable to welcome students who have had been exposed to so many languages, just to get give them the time to settle down and take a big breath before they enter their new educational system. Now, obviously, if you're an EAL coordinator or if you want to help your school provide this service, you're going to have to think about a space if you can. Maybe it can be the language room because I think it it is quite linked to learning a language, isn't it? Whether it's English or another language, we do have very similar techniques. So it might be in the MFL department or it might be a spare room dedicated to EAL learning or literacy um, opportunities, or it might be a corner in the library. Whatever you do, you need to dedicate a space for EAL learning. And in that space, you need to provide role models because role models are extremely important to inspire young people. So it is very, very important that we always reference successful people who had English as an additional language. And we need to celebrate what they brought to the country, their contribution to UK society and UK culture. So if I go back to some famous people who were not English speakers when they arrived to an English speaking country, I'm just going to give you a quote. If I say, you are terminated, who do I remind you of? Yes, of course, I'm reminding you of Arnold Schwarzenegger from Terminator. Yes, so obviously he's not a, a new, young, fresh role model. I think he's in his late 70s, isn't he now? But Arnold Schwarzenegger didn't speak a word of English when he moved to America. He came from Austria and he had quite a strong Austrian accent and he's just arrived speaking German and he started his career in America. So definitely he could be a role model Maybe not for the violent choice of movies he played in, but for just migrating, coming to a new country without mastering the language and giving it a good go and being really successful about it. And I chose Arnold Schwarzenegger because, I mean, he did look amazing in Terminator, but also he has, he has a political career. And I think it's really important to show our students who come to the UK that they might just want to have a normal day job, but they might also want to change careers halfway through their life. And they might want to be interested in politics because I think we can all agree in our current times, we need more diverse young people in politics. Now, another person, and I know you've been, I'm sure you've been watching the tennis um, at Wimbledon. So if you're into tennis, of course, you're going to know the lovely Emma Raducanu. So Emma is the poster girl that everyone, everybody wants to have um, somewhere on the wall in their schools. Because, I mean, let's, let's be honest, she's gorgeous, she's educated, she's successful, and she's sporty, and she looks wholesome, and she's a, a lovely girl role model. So Emma Raducanu is definitely someone you want to promote in your EAL classroom or your EAL corner. Emma has a Chinese mother. So Emma speaks Mandarin as a mother tongue, but Emma also has a Romanian father. So she speaks Romanian with her father. So she's trilingual and English came as her third language when she went to school. So she's your perfect poster girl for English as an additional learning, a uh, language learning. Now there's another actress from America um, that I think most people believe to be American and born in America, but she isn't. And I chose her because she also comes from a country who's very dear to us and it's Ukraine. Now there's a very successful young American actress who's called Mila Kunis. And she, I mean, you might have seen her in the movie Bad Mom, quite a funny movie, by the way. Um, so Mila Kunis was born in Ukraine and her mother tongue is actually Russian and Ukrainian. 
So she's got two mother tongues already. But when she moved to America, she had to learn English at school. So she is a student with EAL. And now, it might be a little bit for an older generation, but I think young people do love using memes on social media and they've all seen memes with Jackie Chan. So Jackie Chan is uh, one of the most successful um, Chinese actor ever. He's from Hong Kong, so he must have spoken Cantonese as his mother tongue, but he moved to the US and he learned English as an additional language. So these are four people you could have uh, on a poster or you could mention during an assembly promoting people who came to a country without speaking the language and made their fortune and their success there. So we did mention when we talked about what decolonizing the EAL curriculum mean, we did mention questioning the society we live in, having a critical mind, questioning the status quo. So if we are interested in decolonizing EAL teaching and learning, we need to be aware of the powers that are at play. And there is something called language inequality that happens in most countries. Now, I've been researching this uh, podcast and I've been looking at representation of, of langu language inequality. And I found that some graphs have been used and devised with a pyramidal shape. So a pyramid puts something more important at the top and others less important at the base. And it, you won't be surprised to know that in some graphs I found online about languages, there is a hierarchy of languages where European languages are at the top and then beneath, as if they were less important, there were regional languages and then national languages and then official languages and then local vernacular dialects or languages. Now this vision of a hierarchy of languages is very detrimental. This is why, for instance, we have a country, Ireland, where most people speak English as a mother tongue, whereas their own language has been forgotten. Now, this is an, an example I'll go back to at the end of this presentation, but Scotland has been working really hard and Wales is very successful at promoting its official language and it's not just English and this is something we need to question colonization brought the destruction of languages this is why in Ireland most young people didn't speak any other language than the language of the colonizer English now we need to think back and we need to question this status quo it is not fair to erase a language we cannot condone this and by teaching that language by having every street sign in wales translated with the english and the welsh we're trying to readjust that balance to invert this pyramid so that people can actually speak the language of their ancestors so this is something we need to have in mind as eal coordinator or people working in schools with young people we need to welcome their language and consider it just as important as English, the language they need to learn to be able to interact with us in society. Now, I'm going to recommend you to do some reading. I know summer is approaching. Uh, you might want to have some books to take with you in your suitcase or if you prefer on your Kindle. There is a book that I highly recommend for any linguist who is interested in fairness, diversity and the universal aspect of education. I'm hoping I'm not going to butcher the pronunciation of the word, How, however, um, my, my knowledge of um, Swahili is pretty low. So the writer from Kenya, Ngugi Wa Chiongo, has written a book in the 90s, in 1983 to be exact, entitled Decolonizing the Mind, the Politics of Language in African Literature. So anyone interested in diversity should read this book because it shows how 
colonization had an effect on languages, not just economy, not just the bodies of the people who were, exp were suffering during the colonization years, not just during the fight for independence, not just in the economic imbalances we still have to fight against in our contemporary societies, but it's also a pollution of the mind. The colonized mind is the mind that will always value the language of the colonizer more than the language of the colonized. So if we value education and culture, we need to value all languages and we need to give them all their share time and we need to provide our students with the means to learn to speak perfect English, but also to speak and write their mother tongue. Now I've started reading this other book that uh, Ngugi, Ngugi Wationgo published just a few years back now. So it's quite a recent book. And it's his account of when he was imprisoned for being a writer, a published writer. Remember, most dictatorships start by burning books and imprisoning the uh, educated and the intellectuals. So Ngugi Wationgo was imprisoned in the 70s and he had nothing else in his cell than some toilet paper, which he used to write his book. And his book is enti entitled Wrestling with the Devil, a prison memoir. And in his book, Ngugi Vachongo is showing how writing in his mother tongue helped him, su helped him survive his imprisonment. So it was a tragic time. Thankfully, he only stayed one year in jail. But during that one year, he kept himself say, sane by writing in his mother tongue. And it was the first time he did that because he always switched to English, you know, the language of the colonizer and the language he learned at university. He went to study in, in the UK. And going back to his mother tongue, I think it was maybe the first novel published in his mother tongue ever. So he did a political action, but he also did a mental health mindfulness action. To save his life, he wrote. I don't think there's anything more powerful as a symbol than a writer surviving prison by writing in his mother tongue. Definitely something to ponder. Now, he's much older than Gugi Vatiango. He's been writing for 50 years. He's the most famous Kenyan writer. He's written lots of novels, fiction as well, not just um, prison memoirs. So you can check his work when you go on holiday. Um, but it's really interesting how he's trying to fight the unwanted legacies of the colonial past, but also promoting his native Kiguyu language. So I'm going to quote... Um, I'm going to quote him because he's just had a, an interview published in a, in a newspaper. And he said that he was obviously imprisoned because he was a writer, but he started to think about language and colonization when he was in prison. And he says, and I quote, if you know all the languages of the world, but you don't know your mother tongue, that is enslavement. But if you know your mother tongue and add all the languages of the world, that is empowerment. Now, this, this is a wonderful quote, and I'm going to write this down on a poster in my EAL classroom, because he's showing that every student who comes to our UK schools and learns to speak English, if it's not their mother tongue, it's great that they learn to speak English but they should not forget their mother tongue and they should not devalue their mother tongue and they should keep learning, practicing and writing in their mother tongue if it's a written language. And if it's not a written language, maybe they should be the writers of the future who are going to write in that unwritten language. Now, he also says that languages and cultures should relate as a network of equal and not as a hierarchy of unequal power relationship. And I'm really keen on that idea because as a French person, 
I'm very much aware when I go back to France of how much English is pervading French culture. So you're going to tell me, oh, don't worry, the French have a very strong culture. It will always be fine. Well, I am worried because I'm not the only one. In Canada, there is a movement that really tries hard to protect French language. We have to remember that most students, most of my teenagers in my life, they are watching mostly American movies. They are playing American video games. They are buying t-shirts with American uh, slogans. They're listening to American music or English music. They're only exposed to English as a cultural, a pop popular culture. It is amazing for me to see that other cultures can be valued. So when I see people listening to K-pop, even though it's not really my type of music, I'm glad to hear that some, a lot of students are downloading an app to learn to speak Korean or Japanese. I think that's wonderful because we need to counterbalance that omnipresence of American culture and we need to also value other cultures. So it's definitely something we need to think. We need to stop having that pyramid with English and French and Spanish at the top, and then maybe all the community languages at the bottom. We need to value all of them and see the beauty in all languages. Now, the last quote I want to say that is really potent when we talk about EAL is that what is neocolonialism? It is when a country is free or independent, but its economy is still controlled by the Western forces that used to colonize it. But it's also when the local culture and the community language or the indigenous language, as it's called, is seen as less valuable. And I see that a lot. I see it when people come to the UK, they settle down and they don't speak their mother tongue to their children. So it might be can people who come from the third world country or low income countries, as we as we call them. But it might also be people coming from other EU countries. I do have friends who come from Denmark, which is definitely a high income country, and they don't speak Danish to their children. And to me, it's like we are. It's almost depriving them of half of who they are. And I think it's really, really sad that we're not promoting learning their mother tongue. I have devised a simple method to encourage people to consider decolonizing the curriculum. And it's called the elastic band method. Because I'm really keen on people understanding that I don't want people to stop learning about Shakespeare or reading Dostoevsky or Proust or Victor Hugo. I don't want people to stop reading the classics. I don't want people to stop reading uh, the beautiful works of art that were written by white middle-class European men over the last 600 centuries, 600 years. This is not what I want. As a, um, someone who promotes decolonizing the curriculum, I want to pull at that elastic band so that we learn and stretch our students more. I want them to read Shakespeare, but I will. I also want them to read a playwright from Kenya or a playwright from South Africa or a playwright from Cuba. I want them to stretch themselves so that they cover the curriculum of the past, which, which is valuable and enriching, and then reach out to the diverse multinational, international, cosmopolitan, open-minded and intersectional curriculum. So this is my elastic band theory, and I want indigenous languages to be learnt, written and spoken, as well as international languages. I want to broaden the mind of our students. So you're going to stop me and say, well, I'm sorry, I might be an EAL coordinator, but I only see my students who are EAL once a week for an hour and we need to teach them about English grammar and I don't have time for anything else. And I completely understand this. I know we keep 
giving more tasks to do to teachers. From marking, to filling reports, to ticking boxes, I'm very much aware of this. However, I do believe that when we teach grammar, we can do it in a diverse way. So what are the EAL challenges? Well, if, you st if your student comes from Afghanistan and just arrives, or if your student comes from Brazil and just arrived, they might have some, learn some knowledge of English gathered from movies, or they might have studied English as a second language in their former country. Whatever situation they're in, they need to learn to speak and write formal English because this is the basics for every child in the UK. But we also need to foster, foster an, an encourage and sense of belonging to this new school. And we need to also teach them about understanding code switching. We don't want our students to just talk like they've been watching a soap, an American soap and use awesome or, or, or terms that are not the formal English they need for their speaking exams, for instance. Or if we let them learn these words, we need to tell them when to use them so that they can code switch efficiently. And furthermore, we need our students to fit in the educational UK system because we need them to feel safe. But what are the risks when we just focus on teaching them grammar? very quickly in an hour every week. The risks is that first, our students are only going to speak their mother tongue with their mother or their, or their father or cousin or aunt, but they're never going to learn to write it, particularly if your EAL students come in primary school. And the other risk is that they might have and develop a feeling of alienation. It's really hard, and I say that as a foreigner, when you come to a country and you live in that country, sometimes you have ideas or memories that pop into your head and you want to share it with the people around you. But you realize, oh, nobody knows this because I'm with people who don't speak my mother tongue. And I guess it's even worse if you're a refugee and you're escaping war, famine, global warming uh, or a disaster zone because you might come on your own without any family left. So all that, the, the private jokes you had in your family or, or the memories of friends and neighbors, they might be all gone. So imagine how you feel when you want to share these inner inside jokes or private jokes and no one can understand them because nobody speaks your language or nobody knows the pun or understands it. It's very alienating and it's very lonely. So as an EAL coordinator, this is another risk we need to take into account because our students might suffer from mental health issues that are maybe even worse because they feel lonely and disconnected because they can't speak their mother tongue or they think they shouldn't. Now, the other risk is losing one's cultural heritage because if you embrace American culture, if you go and settle in America, or if you embrace English, English culture so totally and so unrestrictedly, you might just forget about your own culture and you might just forget your own language. This is a very big risk for our migrant communities settling here. And it comes as many ways, but one of the most obvious ways is giving up on one's own language. And I see it all the time because I do meet people who are French and live in the UK and I see them starting with good intentions. And then as the years go by, their children don't speak French anymore. They only watch English news. They only care about English traditions. And then the children just forget the little bits of language they had learned when they were babies. So when we are EAL coordinators, we need to give English knowledge, literacy, but we also need to protect this culture and this mother tongue that is so important. So with, with this in mind, I'm going to advise you to do some changes in your practice. 
as an EAL coordinator. I'm going to give you some advice on how to make your classroom um, or your corner of the library or the literacy room a little bit more decolonized so that your students with EAL needs or EAL profile have their needs covered. And I'm going to do this after the news. So stay tuned, dear listeners. This episode of Teachers Talk Radio has been made possible with support from Witherslack Group, the UK's leading provider of SEN education and care. They're here to support you too through an ever-growing offer of free resources, including webinars, podcasts, articles and events aimed at supporting teaching professionals like you. Visit their website at www.withaslackgroup.co.uk to find out more. Imagine a world where you were free to focus on sparking curiosity in your students and giving them access to the awe and wonder of learning. A world where you were supported to deliver a truly personalised education to help all your learners achieve their potential. No need to imagine it, because that's exactly what the Oxford Smart Curriculum Service delivers. Seamlessly integrating curriculum, resources, assessment, next steps and professional development, every component of Oxford Smart is connected and working to provide you with a uniquely coherent and responsive service that empowers you and your students with transformational effect. The Oxford Smart Curriculum Service. When everything connects, anything is possible. If you have a passion for education and a talent for teaching and learning, the Witherslack Group want to hear from you. Join them as they open an incredible new school in Essex and be a founding teacher of English, Maths, Science or Primary with multiple leadership opportunities available too. As Teachers Talk Radio partners, we know how much they care about the well-being of staff and their offer to you will be superb. To find out more and apply for a role, visit www.withaslackgroup.co.uk forward slash careers. This is Teachers Talk Radio, and this is Teachers Talk Radio News with Joe Fox. After a week of political turmoil, the weekend news focuses on positive summer news as schools begin to look towards breaking up for the summer. In Bedfordshire, a school trust has opened a wellbeing garden. The Bedfordshire Schools Trust opened the garden as part of its fifth anniversary celebrations. During the pandemic, the Trust had pledged to fund and create areas within all its schools and nurseries, where staff could relax and take some time for themselves. The first garden was opened at the Estonbury Academy. In Hammersmith and Fulham, pupils have joined forces to make the local area cleaner and greener. Students from a range of schools and those pupils in Year 4 and Year 5 met up as part of the Mudlarks project and presented on themes based around the environment and ecology. Topics included reducing the use of plastic at school, clearing up litter from the Grand Union Canal and improving recycling rates. The Mudlarks project teaches children about water ecology, pollution, art and music alongside environmental research and scientific investigation. In Portsmouth, hundreds of children across the city are set for a summer of fun learning as they take part in a summer reading challenge. The national initiative, which promotes the benefits of children aged 4 to 11 reading for pleasure during the school holidays, is supported by the City Council. To complete the challenge, children simply need to borrow and read six or more library books over the summer. The challenge recognises reading in all its forms, including books of any size, graphic novels, poetry, picture books and audio books. The theme of this year's reading challenge is Gadgeteers and is designed to help children discover the world of science and innovation in their everyday lives. A National Youth Summit has been called to offer young people the chance to explore radical solutions to the big topics of the day, from job security and mental health to climate action and ethical working. Funded by the Cooperative Bank and in partnership with Trade Body Cooperatives UK, alongside the group's charity, the National Youth Summit will bring together hundreds of young people and organisations from across the UK. Standard Bank in Africa is empowering Africa through education, 
saying investing in developing the continent's education is crucial to drive sustainable and inclusive economic growth. Given the growth in the continent's population and the socio-economic challenges made worse by the pandemic, education systems must be strengthened to facilitate development. The bank will support projects in areas such as early childhood development, technical education and higher education. This has been your Teachers Talk Radio Weekend News with Joe Fox. Thank you for listening to the news, dear listeners. And we are back to chat about what can we do as EAL coordinator if we want to have a classroom or a corner of the library or an office that is nurturing and offers the best experience for our students with EAL. EAL stands as an acronym for English as an additional language. So any students you have who was born in a different country or maybe born in the UK but has parents who talk to him or her uh, with a different language. It could be Spanish, French, Hebrew, Russian, Ukrainian, Polish, Urdu, Farsi, Mandarin, Cantonese, any language you can think of. So in a perfect decolonized EAL classroom, corner or classroom, you would have first, make sure you have a big, big, big map, world map on one wall. And then you ask every student you have to add a pin you could add a little flag with their name on or a little post-it, but just a pin would be fine. And you ask them to pinpoint where they were born and then link it to where they're at now. So if they're in Scotland, Wales or Ireland or England, just link it with a thread or a piece of cotton thread or wool, just to show that we actually have a student cohort that's very diverse and people come from all continents. So if I'm thinking of my school, I might have students who were born in Somali, in Afghanistan, in Pakistan, in Guatemala, um, I think pretty much everywhere. So have that big world map to decorate your space and let all students feel like they belong. Another thing you could potentially put on the wall is a poster for each student you have and each culture they're from. So it might be a Vietnamese student, so it would be fun to uh, ask that student to choose a poster from their country. I'm not thinking something particularly educational. It might be just a poster advertising a very common food that's eaten in their country. So if, if I'm thinking of France, it might be a petit beurre biscuit, if I'm thinking about my father's country, French-speaking uh, Guinea Conakry, it might be fufu, the type of carbs that people eat. Um, anything that your student likes to eat, ask him to show you a poster online and you print it on A3 paper and then you put it up. Another thing is, would be to have traditional artifacts from the countries your students are from. If you're lucky that they have brought some, that's perfect. If not, I'm sure we can ask around. You'd be surprised when you send a staff email and say, oh, anyone has something from Ghana or from Syria? And you might be surprised some colleagues of yours have been there on a holiday and they can bring it to your classroom. Fabrics are great. I use fabrics a lot in my classroom because it brings up some kind of warmth and homey feeling and also it looks beautiful, it's cheap and it makes your classroom sparkle with colours. Another thing obviously would have to have a flag of each uh, nationality your students have in the hall for instance. I think in my school we would have more than 80 flags minimum. I can understand that in some other areas of the country, you might just have a maybe a Welsh flag and a Scottish flag and an Irish flag, and that's it. But that's it. You, I mean, celebrate the diversity of your student cohort. And if it's only three flags, just give them a great space to, to be broadcast from. Now, if you also have a bit of time, you can source some textbooks from the country your students are from. So I, I was just online and I found a great textbook. It's a Vietnamese textbook and it's got an 
ABC um, design and it, it's just written in Vietnamese. So this is something you could put on a shelf so that it looks welcoming for your students. They might, they might just feel like, oh, this is the textbook I used when I was in primary school in, I don't know, Burkina Faso. Anything that makes them feel like they see a connection, this will fight against that feeling of, you know, alienation and loneliness I was talking about earlier. When you see things that are familiar, you feel like home. And it's a great feeling to have in a classroom as well. Now, another thing, if you have a school budget or if you can ask the local community to support is to give dictionaries. I think any school that has students with EAL, English as an additional language, should have dictionaries for these students so that they can quickly look up for a word. I know most students have access to their phones with Google Translate, but remember, some schools don't allow students to use their phones and some schools don't have enough Chromebooks or computers for all students to access. So a dictionary is old fashioned, but if you have a Polish dictionary, it's not gonna get out of fashion, is it? It can still be in use in 20 years time. So keep the dictionaries or look at charity shops, find if there's people who have just spare dictionaries in any language, Mandarin, Cantonese, anything, and have it in your EAL classroom. Now, this is an idea that I used with my children when they were little, and I was trying to teach them how to read and speak French. So I would add post-its, notes on different parts of the house. If we had a fridge, I would write frigo. If we had um, a toy train, I would write train or train, it's the same spelling. So just post-it notes, maybe use yellow for English and then pink for another language, the language that your EAL, your most recently arrived EAL student has, and make the effort of maybe asking someone who speaks language to tell you, okay, you speak Farsi, can you translate the word for chair, desk, digital board, computer, paper, glue, pencil, and then you have them. So you have in a file, in a, in a little folder, the words for classroom English in all the languages you're gonna need. So you will have maybe 10 post-its, 10 post-it notes with the translations. And then whenever you have a new student who doesn't speak a word of English or just a few, you bring them to your EAL classroom and you show them, okay, uh, in Farsi, the word chair is this, and in English, it's chair. Just a simple thing to give them the basic words they need to express themselves at the beginning, the first few weeks when they arrive, and they are constantly bombarded by words that they don't understand. So actually, if they can point and say paper in English, it will help them. So please have these post notes ready. So that would be the visual side of your decolonized EAL classroom. Now, how to decolonize your methods? Well, my advice is to start with paper because I, I'm very tactile and I love using books and paper, even though I, I do have a Kindle. So my advice would be maybe sit down with an MFL teacher if you need that linguist um, expertise, if you're not a linguist yourself, or if you're an English teacher who specializes in literacy and you want to work on an EAL method, sit down with someone who is used to teaching languages and format, create your own visual school guide. So what I mean by that is most schools give out leaflets when the students come in with the school uniform list, the behavior policy, and some information. And it's all written. And it's usually lots and lots of writing because teachers love writing and reading and lists. Now, the problem with that is that first, some parents don't write or read, whether they're English or English as an additional language speakers. So some people do have um, visual impairments, which makes reading difficult. And also it's a lot of reading to digest. My advice is to have a very simple visual school guide 
with almost no writing. So that's quite a challenge, isn't it? Now imagine you go back to a nursery school. I did work in a nursery and I use a lot of techniques that I used with my two-year-old or my three-year-old with older learners who happen to be learning a new language. So you should have, like in nurseries, my daily routine poster where you have images for every moment of the day and you can add the time. For instance, you would have 8.30, is the bell so you have a bell sign or a classroom sign um, maybe you would have one with washing hands or toilet breaks and the time when break is a picture of the school break uh, playground when it's playground time just have a visual daily routine poster it will help your students when they first come just show it to them you can speak in english when you explain what the daily routine is but you point at the visuals because they will be quickly understood and if you can devise a, a summarized school policy with the behavior steps and maybe a symbol for the achievement or the the merits or whatever you call it we all share the same we always give positives and negatives points don't we so have a school policy in a visual form so that you can give it to parents who don't speak English very well or are struggling with English and you can give it to your students with EAL. Now another thing you could do if you really want to work on having a welcoming inclusive schools for your students with EAL is to ask local community native speakers to come to your school one day. It can be during a day when there's no students if you don't want to have to worry about DBS checks. So ask for an Urdu speaker, a Polish speaker, Ukrainian speaker, um, Farsi speaker, French, Portuguese, any language you think of or you need according to your community. Ask them to read the school policy, the behavior one, I would say that's the most important one maybe. Ask them to read it to you and record them. Ask them maybe to read a summarized version of the school ethos leaflet and ask them to describe the normal school routine or the normal day, such as we come to school at 8.20, we go to class at 8.30, we have the break at 10. Just ask them to read it in their normal language. Record it. Do, you, don't, you don't need to have a great setup. You don't need a special mic. You can use your laptop and one website I don't own shares of, but I really recommend is Vocaroo. So if you use this, you can have a whole library, a recorded library of your school rules and your school description in every language you need. And then next time you welcome a student who arrives straight from, um, I don't know, Patagonia and only speaks Quechua. I'm a bit extreme, but let's say he speaks or she speaks Quechua and Spanish. You just go on your music library or your recording library, press play, and the local person you asked before to read it in Spanish will just present this for them. And it's recorded and it stays there in your files on your computer. Now, if you want to really celebrate your students' background and their mother tongue. It can be a father tongue, by the way, but I, the, the most common one is mother tongue. I don't want to be divisive. So the, the language spoken at home. Make sure there are provision for students who have another language so that they can do their GCSE in another language. So. I know that some uh, there's only AQA and Edexcel that provides uh, GCSE in languages and AQA is a charity. So AQA offers Bengali, Chinese, which is spoken Mandarin, French, German, modern Hebrew, Italian, Punjabi, Polish, Spanish and Urdu. So that's less than 10. I think they should do more for sure. I'd love a Danish one, for instance, because I'm a Danish learner and I would like to do my GCSEs in Danish. So we can always send an email to AQA or Edexcel asking them to offer more languages. But it's great if your school from year seven tells the students, if you speak Urdu, 
you should do your Urdu GCSE. You should do your French and your Spanish because this is what's offered in your school as languages, but you should also do Urdu. And then maybe organize it with the local Urdu speaking community to come to school to help prepare the students for Urdu GCSE. Make the mother tongue or the indigenous or the local or the community languages valued. And this is a school policy that should be impl implemented from year seven. As I said many times, you need help. You can't do it all by just being an English as an additional uh, language coordinator. You're gonna need help from the local people around you. And you shouldn't be shy about asking for help. Have a list of volunteers. I'm sure there are some pensioners or old ladies who have a lot of time and who would love to share their love for their language. There might be fluent Russian speakers, there might be fluent Hebrew speakers. Ask them to come to school and help out. I know there's DBS, but actually a visitor, if you escort the visitor from the reception to your classroom, and if you don't leave the visitor alone, you can actually have people who are not DBS checked helping in, in your school. So don't hesitate. Get volunteer translators from the community, support workers who speak different languages, liaise with the council to get more help and maybe some budget help so that you can have people come and help in your school to foster that community language intake. Now there's some great ideas you can put in place. And I'm just gonna refer you to a book. It's called The Immigrant Cookbook by Leila Mushabek. So her aim, she's American, she wanted to celebrate food brought by different migrants in America. So she created a cookbook. She asked all the friends she knew to bring a recipe from their culture and she wrote down the recipe. So Obviously, if you have a great li school library, you could buy that book. I'm sure there's other ver versions, not just uh, set in America, but in other countries. But my idea is, why don't you ask all your students who speak more than English, EAL students or bilingual or multilingual students, to write a recipe of their favorite family dish? It can be in English. You collate them all in a book with a picture and the picture of their dish, and at the end of the year, you sell the cookery book as a fundraiser. So that's language and culture through culin culinary art. It's a great idea for your food tech teachers, and it's great for literacy. You might have a student who struggles with writing in English because it's the first year they are in an English school. And after doing that project, they feel empowered to write in English. A, a recipe is actually quite simple. You can use simple describing word, uh, simple action words, such as mix, uh, cook, fry. You don't need to make long sentences. So it might be a great tip to put in place for your students with EAL. Um, you might also do a project called the Bedtime Story Project. So first, you might ask parents, to record themselves using Vocaroo or just their phones, reading their favorite bedtime story. If they have access to a camera, they can record themselves reading the bedtime story, showing the pictures. It, you might end up with a full library, a recorded library of bedtime stories in 80 languages. And uh, I would say if there's a visual side to it, it's even better. I would love to see some of my parents reading a history and some uh, story book in Somali or Gujarati. I think it would be wonderful just to listen to the sounds of the language. And now what can you do with your students with EAL? Well, you can tell them to choose one book, a story book, a primary school age story book, so I was thinking of Handa's Surprise, but there's hundreds. There's the Very Hungry Caterpillar. Think of We're Going on a Bear Hunt, although that one, the language is a bit trickier. But any famous primary school aged storybook could be used. And then you ask all your students to read it in their mother tongue so that you celebrate their mother tongue 
and also you make them part of that collective knowledge when you discover a country and a culture the bedtime stories the nursery rhymes the lullabies are part of that heritage and your students with eal might not know about the very hungry caterpillar or hand us surprise, whereas all their peers know because it's classics. So bring that into their experience at school. It will improve their literacy and give them all the cultural baggage that they need. If you have parents who are really keen on being involved in the school community, organize a summer fair at the end of the year, which is an international summer fair. Each stall will be devoted to a country. I'm sure you will find a few people from Morocco, a few people from France, or a few people from Somali. Ask the moms and dads to bring some food that they can sell as a fundraiser. Maybe a few, you know, just little objects that, are can, be, that can be sewn or embroidered or knitted by the grandmas in the area. And just have a few flags, and then you just present it to the parents as the summer fair that celebrates all the local community cultures. Now, I am also very fond of BBC Radio 4, and I listen to The Listening Project, which you might be aware of. It's presented by Fee Glover. The Listening Project is when we record people talking to each other, conversations. It's unscripted and it feels very natural. Now, one thing you could do with the history department is you ask your children to interview family members talking about their childhood or when they arrived to England. And then you would just record them using Vocaroo and publish a collection of all the interviews at the end of the year. If you can film them, that's even better. Or if they can just draw a poster about their grandparents or their family history, it would be a great way to celebrate their heritage. Now that listening project or that recording project is really important, but be, a, be prepared in case you have students who have lost family members. You need to also give them the option to interview other members of their community, just in case, because you don't want to make them relieve trauma if they have absolutely no one in their family. I'm thinking also of fostered children or adopted children. So this is definitely something you can put in place with the history department or the English department, but you need to really know your students as well. Now there is something I want to preach about because I'm very much involved with it. And this is the Saturday morning schools. I do happen to work for a charity school, which is a member of the FLAM network. It's a network of French Saturday morning school or after school clubs that gets a support, sometimes financial, but mostly um, guidance from the AEFE, which is the Agence pour l'enseignement du français à l'étranger. So this little network of French schools offers tuitions and immersion for French speakers who live in any other countries in the world. And I know this is something that is also common. There are Russian schools in London. There are Greek schools in London. There is also Spanish schools in the UK. And there's German schools with the Goethe Institute. And for Spanish, it's the Cervantes Institute. You'd be surprised to see how many Saturday morning schools there are in the world. There's, you just need two or three parents who want to promote their language and their mother tongue and their culture to set up a language school on a Saturday morning. So my advice is try and reach out to these schools, try and make them connect with your school, do events together, or you might also doing something that's really interesting if you have budget issues. It's getting extra income for your school or extra fundraising. Letting your school building or your classrooms for language schools is a good way to bring some extra needed cash, but also allows these little community language schools to flourish and they will be connected to your local community of students. 
Another thing you could do is also contact embassies and invite speakers. If you have a very big, strong Polish community in your local area, why not contact the Polish embassy and ask them if they could have connections or networks to share with you, contacts. You could have a writer from Poland visiting the embassy and then maybe coming to your school to present their books. Don't hesitate to reach out and ask for help or guidance. You might be surprised by all the help you'll get. There is also extra funding offered by many, many associations and charities and institutions. For instance, there is such a thing as the British Spanish Society, which is an independent UK registered charity, which offers scholarship awards for students. So have a look at, around and tell your students. And if there's um, a contest or um, just a prize offered, you can just mention it to your students and encourage them to apply. Now we are getting to the last part of this podcast where I'm going to talk about extra resources and I'm going to give you an essay proposition in case you really want to think more about EAL uh, teaching. First, we need to focus on giving the correct English vocabulary to our students who are learning English. I did mention code switching earlier, the ability to know when you can use slang or formal, depending on your audience and whom you're interacting with. It is really important to teach our students formal English because they will need it to get a job, but it is also important to teach them when they can use formal English and when they're free not to. So teaching diverse English is important. I'm going to refer to a website that should be one of your bookmarked websites if you happen to teach English, and it is Writing with Color. So https hyphen slash slash writingwithcolor.tumblr.com slash so Writing with Color is an amazing website with resources on how to write with a, think, a thinking on racial, ethnic and religious diversity. So it's very, very useful for anyone who wants to work on creative writing and give um, critical tools for the students to be able to know when they should use words and when they should avoid them. There is a lot about eye shape, about skin tones, about hair, about lots of terms that are considered sometimes offensive. So it's really important our students are given the right tools to be able to learn English and the subtleties of the language. Another way we can celebrate diversity in visuals, and it's another website I really sincerely advise you to check, it's Angelica Das website. Angelica Das is a Brazilian photographer and she started a project called the Humane Project where she takes pictures of people and then finds the, a background which matches their exact skin tone. So check it out. It's called Angelica Das, D-A-S-S, and it's the Humane Project. This is something that looks amazing on any school corridor wall it's a poster we should all have somewhere people's skin tones and the diversity of skin color is wonderful she's brazilian so there is definitely a lot of diverse skin tone colors in brazil and she did that beautiful project photographing the the beauty of people's skin color from babies to elderly and another book I really recommend for you to buy and purchase and exhibit in your school library or your decolonized e EAL classroom. It's a book that was published by Mihaela Norok. And Mihaela is Romanian, so she's a photographer from Bucharest. She's in her 30s and she started photographing women all over the world, from India to Africa to South America. And Mihaela decided to photograph beautiful women, but her beautiful women are not 
fitting a normal Caucasian beauty standard. They are women of every shape, every color, every age. There's the youngest one might be in toddlers and the oldest one might be in their 90s. And they're all beautiful women. It's a very diverse, inclusive book she published and it's called The Atlas of Beauty. There is a website, theatlasofbeauty.com. It's a wonderful tool to encourage diversity, celebrate uh, people who are migrants, people who are refugees, people who have different uh, ethnicities, ancestry. It's a wonderful piece of work. Now, if you want to think about the UK as a country and as, as a, an institution, I should say, as countries, because it's made out of four countries, we need to talk about devolution. I don't have time to talk about devolution today, but I just wanted to just pl plant the seed. So when we talk about EAL with English as an additional language, we need to think about what we did in the UK over the past 300 years. And the fact that we tried to erase national languages such as Gaelic and, and it's really important that we think about that because it has an impact. Most Irish people do not speak their own mother tongue. It was, it was taken away from them. So I think it's really important to celebrate schools that are trying to bring the mother tongue back to life. So um, I wouldn't attempt to pronounce it, but there's a, a website, um, Gaelodeash, I'm, I'm, I'm butchering the sound, I'm sure. Uh, it's uh, G-A-E-L-O-I-D-E-A-C-H-A-S. And it's a school in Ireland that's um, promoting the um, Irish language. So definitely something you might want to have a think about. The fact that we promote English as a colonizing language, but now we need to look back and think, we need to stop that hierarchy of languages. We need to promote languages because remember that, that wonderful quote, um, I'm just going to read it again because I think it's important to finish on a, on a beautiful, with a beautiful quote. So this is a quote from the Kenyan writer, Ungugi Vachongo, who wrote Decolonizing the African Mind in 1983. And I'm going to quote him. If you know all the languages of the world and you don't know your mother tongue, that is enslavement. But if you know your mother tongue and add all the languages of the world, that is empowerment. So Ngugi Vatiango said it all. I mean, it's in a nutshell what we're trying to do for our English as an addi additional language students. We want them to learn English so that they can join our society, but we want them to nurture their mother tongue and keep writing and reading it and talking it because we want them to be empowered. And we want a network of languages. We want languages to nourish and interconnect like they've always done. Remember, English is a mix of um, German tribal languages and Old Norse um, and a bit of French and Latin. So we need to let our languages nurture each other so that we keep all our languages thriving. So I'm going to stop on that note and I hope you enjoyed this talk. Our subject of the day was English as an additional learning coordinator and its role in a diverse education, its role to promote diversity. It was a delight sharing this topic with you today and I'm just going to leave you with the news for a second turnaround and I'm hoping you're going to enjoy that beautiful summer weather we've had so far. Have a fantastic week dear listeners and I'm really looking forward to seeing you next, talking to you next Sunday. Thank you.
This episode of Teachers Talk Radio has been made possible with support from Witherslack Group, the UK's leading provider of SEN education and care. They're here to support you too through an ever-growing offer of free resources, including webinars, podcasts, articles and events aimed at supporting teaching professionals like you. Visit their website at www.withaslackgroup.co.uk to find out more. Imagine a world where you were free to focus on sparking curiosity in your students and giving them access to the awe and wonder of learning. A world where you were supported to deliver a truly personalised education to help all your learners achieve their potential. No need to imagine it, because that's exactly what the Oxford Smart Curriculum Service delivers. Seamlessly integrating curriculum, resources, assessment, next steps and professional development, every component of Oxford Smart is connected and working to provide you with a uniquely coherent and responsive service that empowers you and your students with transformational effect. The Oxford Smart Curriculum Service. When everything connects, anything is possible. If you have a passion for education and a talent for teaching and learning, the Witherslack Group want to hear from you. Join them as they open an incredible new school in Essex and be a founding teacher of English, Maths, Science or Primary with multiple leadership opportunities available too. As Teachers Talk Radio partners, we know how much they care about the well-being of staff and their offer to you will be superb. To find out more and apply for a role, visit www.withaslackgroup.co.uk forward slash careers. This is Teachers Talk Radio, and this is Teachers Talk Radio News with Joe Fox. After a week of political turmoil, the weekend news focuses on positive summer news as schools begin to look towards breaking up for the summer. In Bedfordshire, a school trust has opened a wellbeing garden. The Bedfordshire Schools Trust opened the garden as part of its fifth anniversary celebrations. During the pandemic, the Trust had pledged to fund and create areas within all its schools and nurseries, where staff could relax and take some time for themselves. The first garden was opened at the Estonbury Academy. In Hammersmith and Fulham, pupils have joined forces to make the local area cleaner and greener. Students from a range of schools and those pupils in Year 4 and Year 5 met up as part of the Mudlarks project and presented on themes based around the environment and ecology. Topics included reducing the use of plastic at school, clearing up litter from the Grand Union Canal and improving recycling rates. The Mudlarks project teaches children about water ecology, pollution, art and music alongside environmental research and scientific investigation. In Portsmouth, hundreds of children across the city are set for a summer of fun learning as they take part in a summer reading challenge. The national initiative, which promotes the benefits of children aged 4 to 11 reading for pleasure during the school holidays, is supported by the City Council. To complete the challenge, children simply need to borrow and read six or more library books over the summer. The challenge recognises reading in all its forms, including books of any size, graphic novels, poetry, picture books and audio books. The theme of this year's reading challenge is Gadgeteers and is designed to help children discover the world of science and innovation in their everyday lives. A National Youth Summit has been called to offer young people the chance to explore radical solutions to the big topics of the day, from job security and mental health to climate action and ethical working. Funded by the Cooperative Bank and in partnership with Trade Body Cooperatives UK, alongside the group's charity, the National Youth Summit will bring together hundreds of young people and organisations from across the UK. Standard Bank in Africa is empowering Africa through education, saying investing in developing the continent's education is crucial to drive sustainable and inclusive economic growth. Given the growth in the continent's population and the socio-economic challenges made worse by the pandemic, education systems must be strengthened to facilitate development. The bank will support projects in areas such as early childhood development, technical education and higher education. This has been your Teachers Talk Radio Weekend News with Joe Fox. 
This is Two Minute Tech with Steve Woods, your tech briefing on Teachers Talk Radio. Hello, this week I'm going to support a question everyone will see at the start of next year. It goes something like this. Hi Edu Twitter, can you reply with where you are so I can show my class how far a post on the internet can reach? With a bit of free tech, you can make this much more visual. I'm going to use Google Maps because it's free and most likely you'll have used Google Maps at some point in the past. So, when you have all your responses, sign into Google, go to Maps and click on the menu next to the search box. That's the three lines that look like a burger. From the menu, select My Places. You'll now have four options. Lists, Labeled, Visited, and maps. Click on maps and at the bottom select create map. Now you can give the map a title so you can find it next year for comparison and add all the places from your Twitter replies. Simply type the name of the place. When it appears with a blue point marker you can click the plus sign to add it to the map and then select the colour to help it stand out. When you're finished all the places will be saved and you can access the map by following the first few steps. Menu, my places, maps. There are loads of other great tools to use also. Measure the distance from your school to those places. Hit preview and go into the view only mode. Here you can select a place and you treat it to a short bio and an image of the area. So next time you're looking to bring a lesson to life, why not try using maps to help pupils see where places are in the world? Do you have any top tips for mapping? Why not get in touch at TT Radio 2022? Follow us and tell us what you want to know about tech. I'm Steve Woods and that was Two Minute Tech. This is Teachers Talk Radio, and you are listening live. You've been listening to Teachers Talk Radio. Tune in live and listen back at ttradio.org. We look forward to hearing from you next time on Teachers Talk Radio.